Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Cohen, for accepting my invitation to speak to us tonight. Um, yeah, the stage is yours. Thanks very much. Can, can you see my slides and can you hear me? Yes, I can see your slides and okay. I can hear you well. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Again, my name is Nate Cohen. Um, I'm an assistant professor of neurology and pediatrics at George Washington in Washington, D.C., and an epileptologist at the Associated Children's Hospital. Um, so these are my research funds, and I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So briefly, I'll go over a, a clinical summary of hypothalamic hematoma. Then we'll talk about uh, steps in the diagnosis, uh, pathophysiology and imaging, talk about current understanding of the genetics of HH, and talk a little bit about comorbidities, and then potential future directions. So the hypothalamus is the region in the basal forebrain. Um, it controls the autonomic nervous system, and it's important in numerous mechanisms, body temperature, thirst, hunger, other homeostatic mechanisms as well as being involved in sleep and emotional activity. Uh, we all know that the hypothalamus is in magenta. It's a deeply located um, gland, and it's the link between the endocrine and nervous systems. And it secretes hormones that help to provide the homeostatic balance, including antidiuretic hormone, corticotropin-releasing hormone, gonadotropin-releasing hormone, growth hormone-releasing hormone, among many others. So hypothalamic hamartomas are rare lesions that come from the ventral hypothalamus, and there are basically two classic phenotypes. In the top left, you see the parahypothalamic hamartoma or pedunculated um, hamartoma, and you can see on the scheme and the relevant MRI. Um, with these, uh, endocrinopathy is common, but epilepsy is rare. The other three panels show intrahypothalamic hamartomas or sessile. And these are the ones that are associated with the intractable epilepsy, developmental regression, psychiatric and behavioral comorbidities, and precocious puberty. So the prevalence of HH is about one in 200,000, although it may be more rare depending on what study you, you, you read. It, it's associated with epilepsy of numerous different seizure types. We all know gelastic seizures are the spells of mirthless and uncontrollable laughter. These figures on the right are from a study where uh, the authors are showing patients having uh, focal gelastic seizures and their, their HH on the MRI, the, each patient's MRI on the, to the right. Uh, other seizures that are associated with HH include focal unaware seizures, Dechristic or crying seizures, atypical absence, tonic, atonic, and generalized tonic clonic seizures, and infantile spasms. The seizures usually begin at a young age with gelastic seizures presenting before 12 months and focal seizures uh, between two and seven years. The prevalence of pharmacoresistance is unknown, but it's estimated to affect more than half to all patients again, study dependent. The diagnosis remains challenging uh, due to the deep-seated nature of the hypothalamus. Um, the, the scalp EEG can be falsely negative in the interictal period and seizures can be difficult to localize. In one study of 133 patients that captured 584 gelastic seizures, three quarters of the seizures had no scalp EEG change. Uh, imaging is it's recommended to get a high resolution epilepsy protocol three Tesla MRI uh, sequences include 3D T1 with less than one cubic millimeter voxels a T2 weighted sequence and a 2D flare sequence but preferentially a, a 3D would be better. The 2014 Florence Consensus of the ILAE Pediatric Epilepsy Surgery Task Force recommends ictal and interictal EEG, uh, but PET and SPECT are not necessary. The figure on the right is meant to show the intrinsic epileptogenicity of the lesion. So in stereo EEG, the low voltage fast activity from the hematoma leads, and then they're spread to uh, later throughout the seizure into other cortical regions. There are different 
classification schemes for hematomas, the most common, the commonly used one is uh, the de la Lande classification. Type one is in the top left, which uh, is which, in which the hematoma is horizontally inserted and below the floor of the third ventricle. Type two is where the hematoma is vertically inserted to the wall and above the floor of the third ventricle. Type three uh, is, is horizontally and vertically inserted and then above and below the floor of the third ventricle. And type fours are giant or eight centi cubic centimeters or larger. So comorbidities are common. Uh, neurodevelopmental and behavioral issues are frequent. Psychiatric comorbidities affect more than half of patients. Rage attacks are described uh, and aggression and attentional problems are common. Cognitive impairments affect more than 80% of patients. And these can be progressive in half of cases. HH is considered an epileptic encephalopathy where an increasing seizure burden is associated with worsening seizure out or worsening cognitive outcomes. And some other data for the epileptic encephalopathy is that removal or disconnection of the HH can lead to qualitative improvement in cognitive outcomes. In single center studies, there's increased post-operative full-scale IQ in patients who had undergone pre- and post-operative neuropsych testing. This figure is from a 14-year-old who had a 20-millimeter hamartoma with multiple seizures and drug-resistant epilepsy who had mild and moderate intellectual impairment. And in panel A, you see that there's preoperative bilateral spike and polyspike and wave discharges without any normal background features. Panel B shows the EEG just three weeks after a transcolossal resection, and there's normalization of the background activity. You see a gradient, good posterior basic rhythm, and an absence of epileptiform discharges. So the etiology of the encephalopathy is not necessarily clear. It may be due to seizures, interictal discharges, or both. It may be due to disruptions of structural or functional projections or it may be due to local effects um, leading to endocrine or functional disturbances, such as a diencephalic syndrome. And there are data from PET studies to support this. The common imaging findings of HH on MRI is that they are non-enhancing um, compared to gray matter. They are T2 hyperintense, T1 hypointense, and they're usually between two and 20 millimeters in diameter. They're best appreciated on thin T2 weighted slices, prefer preferably in the coronal plane. Here in the top right, you see a hamartoma that's T2 bright and relative to the out, uh, outer cortex. Um, and then one common misdiagnosis is interhypothalamic adhesion, which is a thin band of tissue between the medial walls of the, the third ventricle. So switching gears a little bit, uh, we can talk about the, the genetics of HH and what's currently understood. So Michael Hildebrand in 2016 showed that in 14 patients uh, out of 38 with non-syndromic hamartomas uh, had somatic mutations in the sonic hedgehog pathway, which regulates neurogenesis and cell patterning. So this figure just shows in panel A, the hedgehog pathway in the presence of hedgehog, and then uh, on the right in B, the absence of hedgehog. So when sonic hedgehog is present, it binds to patched, then smoothened, can translocate to the nucleus where it inhibits phosphorylation of the GLE2-3 complex. Uh, this GLE1, 2, and 3, and CREB-BP, uh, in the nucleus lead to upregulation of transcription as well as downstream proliferation. Now, when hedgehog is absent, then patched uh, inhibits the uh, smooth end, and which then remains endosomal. The GLE2-3 is bound by SUFU and uh, phosphorylated cleaved, and then this cleavage product uh, translocates to the nucleus where GLE2-3 uh, represses the downstream, downstream transcription. So uh, the GLE3 gene variant location can lead to different clinical manifestations. 
Here's a model on the right of the, the GLE3 gene and uh, mutations in the uh, middle one third of the gene as shown on the top here are associated with the Pallister-Hall syndrome, which is associated with syndromic hypothalamic hamartoma, digital anomalies, airway anomalies, including bifid epiglottis, GI anomalies, including imperforate anus and renal anomalies, and an overall less severe epilepsy and neuropsych profile. Uh, variants in the first or last third of the GLEE3 gene lead to the Grieg cephalopolysyndactyly syndrome, where you have the digital anomalies, hypertelorism, macrocephaly, but this is not typically associated with hypothalamic hematoma. And this mechanism was demonstrated in Drosophila model, showing that the GLEE3 frame shift mutation directs the downstream function of the protein as either activating or repressing. So more recent data suggests that hypothalamic hamartoma may be a ciliopathy. This model on the right shows what we looked at two slides back, uh, the, the hedgehog pathway, but just projected onto the, the cilia. And more, more recent study has shown in seven patients that there are biallelic variants in cilia and sonic hedgehog genes smoothened. And then green in 2022, showed in 27 surgically resected hamartomas that seven patients had biallelic uh, variants, that, that is one germline and one somatic mutation in hamartoma DNA in one of four cilia genes. The dynin motor protein shown in red, the IFT complex seen here in green or smoothened uh, seen in teal. And eight patients had uh, mutations in, in uh, previously established uh, GLEE3 or OFD1. So comorbidities are common. Uh, psychiatric disorders affect 60 to 80% of patients. Rage attacks in a study of 46 children with hypothalamic hamartoma, more than half had rage attacks. And these are uh, typically from increased aggressiveness uh, and they may be due to difficulty with emotional self-regulation. They're not clearly linked to the epilepsy, but they're more common if the patient is male, has intellectual disability, has a younger onset, and has multiple seizure types. Uh, oppositional defiant disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, anxiety, and mood disorders are common, uh, but these rates are similar to see those seen in other pediatric epilepsies. And there are high rates of depression and anxiety seen in adult patients. So these are data from the International Survey uh, of 20 from 20 countries, uh, the families of 256 respondents, uh, mean age of 18 years. And you can see the percentage of responders here. The gold line is adults and the green line is adult and pediatric respondents. And you can see there are high rates of anxiety, social anxiety, depression, and other neurocognitive, behavioral, and psychiatric problems that are commonly reported. So the cognitive profile can vary from normal to severe disability. Neurodevelopmental disability is more common in patients who have both hamartoma and epilepsy. And there's more severe cognitive impairment in patients who have early seizures, increased seizure burden, and increased number of medications and for some patients, a larger lesion size. But treatment can improve outcomes. In a study of 48 patients with hamartoma-related epilepsy, um, preoperatively, half had executive and 62% had verbal dysfunction. The majority had improvements in intellectual function after either stereotactic radiofrequency thermocoagulation, or SRT, or some type of resection. In a different study, 88 patients showed postoperative improvement in neuropsych testing after uh, radiofrequency thermocoagulation. The relationship between seizures and cognition is not exactly clear because there are cases where seizures can be controlled by surgery, but there can be ongoing comorbidity and encephalopathy. And many patients have developmental or cognitive impairment that predates the recognition of hamartoma related epilepsy. So, there are many endocrine problems associated with HH, 
uh, preoperatively, there's central precocious puberty, which is thought to be due to pulsatile release of gonadotropin release, re releasing hormone. And occasionally, um, patients can have hypogonadism or acromegaly. Postoperatively, uh, either postsurgical or radiation induced, there can be DI or diabetes insipidus, growth hormone deficiency, central hypothyroidism, and the hypothalamic obesity syndrome, which is hyperphagia. Uh, weight gain, and it's seen in about a fifth of patients. Its management includes diet, exercise, and medications, including octreotide or newer drugs, and bariatric surgery. The mechanism is not exactly clear, uh, as up to half of patients can have preoperative obesity. But one thought is that postoperative injury to posterior hypothalamic subnuclei may be involved, as these areas are typically uh, involved in energy expenditure and their damage would, would decrease such. So back to the comorbidity survey, of the 256 respondents, 162 had one or more surgical or radiation treatments and half reported seizure freedom. About a third had ablations, about a third had resections, and a third had other procedures. Uh, the top caregiver concerns included seizures, cognitive sequelae, concerns about the patient's future, concerns about the psychiatric and behavioral comorbidities, concerns about an inability for the patient to lead an independent life, patient safety, and sudden unexplained death in epilepsy or SUDEP. Uh, majority of respondents more than 60% reported memory, learning, or developmental delay. Majority had rage attacks uh, and emotional dysregulation. And endocrinopathies were common, including 40% reporting precocious puberty and temperature regulation issues, and about a fifth having hypothyroidism. So this is a summary slide of uh, fr from our article in neurology. And uh, basically, uh, in a study of 136 patients undergoing endoscopic treatment, a good outcome or angle one and two was achieved in 77% of patients. Overall, the endoscopic procedures were complicated 8% uh, of the time with memory deficits, third nerve palsy, uh, and motor problems being the most common. Um, patients who had shorter duration of epilepsy tended to do well, and this can worsen pre-existing uh, cognitive deficits and may be associated with more complications with larger hematomas. Gamma knife surgery in a study of 135 patients, good outcome was achieved in 57%. Um, this can be complicated by a transient increase in seizures or uh, temperature instability. And it's good for most hematoma classes, but not for large hematomas. And it may be associated with a delayed uh, treatment effect that takes up to two years. Stereotactic radiofrequency thermocoagulation in uh, 210 patients. Angle 1 was reported in 88%. The authors reported no complications. And it was good for uh, patients with a shorter duration of epilepsy. Works well for all sizes and types. And it may have uh, good outcomes for non-gelastic seizures. Laser interstitial thermal therapy, or LIT, so from 101 patients, angle one was reported in 93%. Um, this can be associated with uh, endocrinopathies, most commonly uh, thyroid issues and memory dysfunction. It's good for smaller lesions and larger lesions may be associated with salt wasting and about a quarter needed a second ablation procedure. There are newer modalities such as focused ultrasound. Here, uh, uh, three patients were reported with 66% had angle one outcome, but the N is too small to make any broad generalizations. And I'll defer most of the surgical discussion to our, our neurosurgeon here today. Uh, so what can we learn from other encephalopathies? There may be a precedent for pathway specific targeting. If you look at low-grade gliomas, these can present as a hypothalamic tumor with a diencephalic syndrome and associated encephalopathy that improves with molecular inhibition therapy targeting the BRAF mutation. If we look at patients with tuberous sclerosis, in a randomized controlled trial of 32 patients who were getting everolimus treatment for 12 months between ages four and 17 years who did not have intractable epilepsy, they failed to achieve cognitive or neuropsych improvement, but the authors 
wrote that treatment would most probably need to be initiated in very young patients with TS when plasticity and developmental speed are at its peak and mTOR hyperactivation might not yet have caused permanent alterations to the neurodevelopment of the child. So this may represent a therapeutic opportunity. Vismodigib is a smoothened inhibitor that decreases hedgehog pathway activation. It's already approved for clinical use in basal cell nevus syndrome for lesion shrinkage. And so future studies that, that look at this and other, uh, other treatment options should, should target neuropsych outcomes as well. Uh, the care for hamartoma, hypothalamic hamartoma patients is inconsistent for, and it's not consistent for all children. Uh, their uh, standardized pre- and post-operative diagnostic and treatment uh, guidelines are lacking. And there's a need for coordinated prospective observational study with standardized assessments and measures to study the effect of these treatments in a multi-center way on seizure control, uh, encephalopathy, and comorbidities. So in summary, hypothalamic hemartomas are rare lesions that arise from the ventral hypothalamus. They're associated with a high rate of pharmacoresistant epilepsy. They're complicated by numerous cognitive, behavioral, psychiatric, and endocrine comorbidities. The care for patients is inconsistent, and there's a need for diagnostic and therapeutic guidelines. But there is hope. The recent discoveries of the genetic underpinnings may yield novel molecular treatment targets. Uh, there are basic and translational studies that are ongoing, and combining that with standardization of care will hopefully lead to improved outcomes for patients. Uh, this is just our reference for the, the, the review of hypothalamic hematomas that is in neurology in November 2021. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. And thank you so much to the organiz organ organizers and uh, to Hope for Hypothalamic Hematoma for having me. Thank you, Nate. So that was amazing, wonderful. You covered many, many things in a short period of time. Um, while the audience um, may pop up some questions here, I do have a few for you, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, so the, my first question is about um, a neurology care for this patient. So in, it's my understanding that in many parts of the world, the neurologist becomes the primary physician for, for complicated um, cases. Um, and that's, it, that's a reality in, in many centers, um, unfortunately. So, if you have to give some guidance for those who are listening to us and they are they work as a as a primary care physicians or their of their patients so other than psychiatry endocrinology is there any other subspecialty that you feel like needs to follow these patients closely with along with us or basically this is the the let's say the the three main um, specialists that will have um, um, an important role supporting these families and children. Yeah, I think that uh, what, what you said, uh, those would be the most common. And then, you know, if there's any behavioral uh, therapists, I, I guess that would be uh, dependent on your resources. Um, I would also just wonder what uh, Lisa and Erica um, would recommend from, from their experience. Um, uh, I don't know if yeah. they're... From the from the comorbidities you listed, I uh, I feel like um, we are in an agreement here. Maybe Lisa and Erica will pop up at the end yeah, to yeah, share their sure. experiences, right? So, uh, yeah, thank you for that. So I also have a question about the genetics that you mentioned, the Sonic Hedgehog pathway. Um, the paper from 2016, I guess. Um, do you know if they have any different outcomes for those patients who had a genetic? abnormality, uh, I'm not speaking about the syndromic cases, but the non-syndromic cases, whether having a genetic test could, um, you know, um, um, could predict a better or a worse outcome? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the problem is it's, I don't know uh, specifically about the non-syndromic, um, and I think that this testing is, you know, somewhat difficult to achieve just based on my discussions with, with them. Um, you know, sampling the, the tissue and trying to obtain these somatic uh, variants is, is hard to, it's mm -hmm. hard to get the, the tissue sample and, and to run it on that. Um, but I, I, would, um, I would, I would go back to the Hildebrand paper to okay. you know, find out more about, about what, you know, 
the impact of that will be. Yeah. Yeah. So um, also, I feel like the, the, the one of the biggest problems is the lack of ICTO correlation with the gelastic seizures. I don't know if you share the same um, um, concern, but um, the children have different behavioral things. And then we are always expecting to see the EG correlate with that. And sometimes it's just very frustrating that we don't have that. So um, yeah, so do, would you say that uh, this is, is a problem as well, even in, in ultra specialized centers with, uh, you know, um, a lot of EG channels and video monitoring and everything? Yeah, I'm, I mean, it's, it's not even really well described uh, where the where these gelastic seizures can arise because you know they can be from the hematoma, they can be from frontal lesions. Uh, you know they're, they're difficult to to localize, um, and uh, yeah, I, I think that you know the point is it, in general it's it's better to the, the care is it, it, you know at these at centers at specialized centers can be can be helpful um if if you have a patient that you're worried about you know to to reach out and also to reach out to a group like um h hope for hh because there's so much uh, information and experience yeah great so i have a question here for you regarding treatment so what is the more prescribed anti seizure medications for hh do we have an answer for that i you know I don't know that there are great data about the medical management. Um, I don't know if you, if you have um, any, I'm not aware of any specific me anti-seizure medication that, yeah. that is works better than, than yeah. another. Um, I agree. So I agree with you. I feel like Kepra is always the safest medication, but um, the behavioral concerns we have for these patients might um, prevent us from prescribing it sometimes, yeah. uh, right? So, but uh, overall broad spectrum um, uh, medications, right? Anybody else has any questions for Dr. Coyne? So if not, I'll just once again, say thank you for your comprehensive um, lecture. Um, I enjoyed so much and I hope everybody did. So before,